first video in the new place. If you've been following me on this channel, you know we tend to cover some of the darker sides of nature. Well, maybe not darker, but things that make you definitely lose your appetite. I'd say that recently things have gotten particularly heinous with the video where I ate the scorpion and the most recent episode of What the Fuck Is This? So. This week we're doing a palate cleanser for you and especially for my editor Gian, who at this point I've traumatized multiple times. No, 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 no. It's a cozy reset while also staying true to the ambiance of this channel. So today you are safe to eat your bowl of noodles while I introduce you to some of the cutest extinct animals you've never heard of. Before we get into it, welcome to my new home. I tried to keep the background similar to the previous one because I did actually like it a lot. And I'm going to give you a little apartment tour at the end of the video. If you're interested, stick around for that. Also, I got my hat back. Hooray. So there's a chance some of you watching are already unsure about the legitimacy of today's topic. A video on cute prehistoric animals seems, one, a bit subjective, and two, a bit speculative for a science channel. I'm gonna tackle both of these concerns now before we get into the animals. So first, cute is subjective. Finding something cute is an opinion, not a fact, which is inherently not science. So to take care of this, as you might have seen from the community post, I made a survey to determine the top qualities people associate with cuteness. A bit overboard, maybe, but fuck it, why not? It ended up being a sample size of 4,415 people, which I'd say is pretty solid. Thank you all for participating. I'm not going to turn this into a stats class because this is literally not the point of the video, but uh, let's just get right into the results. What did you guys say are the traits most associated with cuteness? 30% of you said some variation of fluffy, fuzzy, or soft. About 29% of you said some variation of big eyes, large eyes. About 16% of you said a variation of small, teeny, tiny, little. And 6.9% of you said rat. And the remaining 18% was a mixed bag, like a affectionate, squishability, etc. Lots of other things. But we have a solid main for small, big eyes, fluffy, and round. I also had a bonus question asking what a stereotypically cute animal is. The main ones were definitely cats, dogs, lots of variations of kitten, puppy, red pandas, elephants, capybaras, bunnies, you know, mostly small mammals with the exception of elephants. But I'll get back to that. Actually, axolotls showed up a lot too. And frogs. Should have worn my frog shirt. So let's say animals with four limbs. I'd argue the stereotypical cute animals that we typically think of are tetrapods have four limbs. This can be overruled though with big eyes, like rock, paper, scissors. Big eyes beats four legs. For example, spiders, classic not cute group. Eight legs, four legs, two minutes. But throw some big eyes on it and suddenly you got a jumping spider on TikTok with three million likes. Boom, overruled. Same with snakes, zero legs, four legs, two feet. Another classic not cute group. But you tell me right now that Tino wasn't the cutest little thing on this planet when he was a baby. Boom, overruled. He's cute now, but when he was a baby, I was changing people's minds about their opinions of snakes. I will say that. I didn't research the psychology of why humans think small animals with big eyes are cute, but I think we can definitely agree that it's because they look like babies and vulnerable little things, and humans like to take care of babies that are vulnerable little things, as well as other animals. We've seen that in countless other species and social animals like us, of course. Watch it not be that reason at all, and I just made myself look like an asshole. That's fine. I'm sticking with it. As for the four limbs and fluffiness, maybe because we like creatures that are more similar to us, mammals? That's just a thought. I don't know. Okay, so now we have more of a scientific understanding of what cute is, but we don't know exactly what these prehistoric animals looked like. We have the fossils, and artist reconstructions are a bit speculative in some aspects, but it turns out that under the right conditions, with exceptionally well-preserved fossils, we can see all the traits on our list in the fossil record. Small, boom, big eyes, boom, round. I will show you. And fluffy, I will show you. And also, regardless, I think it's okay to relax and have fun sometimes. We don't have to be so uptight all the time. It's okay to enjoy things and smile and say, we don't know exactly, but we have a good idea and that's okay and it's fun to roll with. So with that being said, allow me to introduce you to a Neuronathus, a small little pterosaur that was alive during the Jurassic in what is now Germany. Let me give you a quick recap on what the fuck pterosaurs had going on before we move any further so we're all on the same page. Pterosaurs were flying reptiles that were alive from 210 to 66 million years ago. They lived alongside the dinosaurs, but were not dinosaurs, just closely related to them, a big, big, misconception as we know. Maybe I should define what a dinosaur is. Mm, no, this is already a tangent. I'm not gonna do a tangent off of another tangent. I'll save that for another day. Pterosaurs were the first flying vertebrates to ever exist that we know of, and came in a variety of sizes from the largest that we know of, Quetzalcoatlus, that had something like a 40 foot wingspan and some of the smallest that we know of, like our little guy today, a Neuronathus. A Neuronathus hits all of our classic cute characteristics, small, big eyes, round, and fluffy. And I will show you the evidence for each of them. The first fossil of a Neuronathus was found in the Solnhofen, Solnhofen limestone of Germany and described in 1923 by paleontologist Ludwig Heinrich Philipp 
daughter line. Germans, please don't come after me. The fossil was pretty crushed, was not well preserved, but seemed to have had a wingspan of a mere 10 inches long. And that's just the wingspan. Body length wise, they seem to have been about three and a half inches long. So very teeny, boom, small. A second fossil of a Neuronathus found in 2007 had a slightly larger wingspan of about 13 inches. So still small, still valid. Scientists estimate that a Neuronathus would have weighed about 40 grams, which is less than the weight of a newborn kitten. Uh. The second, more well-preserved fossil of a Neuronathus also confirms they had large orbits or eye sockets. You know what that means? Boom, big eyes. Also good to note here that large sclerotic rings found on the fossil confirms they had large eyes as well. Those are rings of bone found in the eyes of lots of vertebrate animals like fish, reptiles, birds. Mammals don't have them. We just don't have them. Oh, also the skull is delicate and ramped. Boom, ramped. So, so far we got small big eyes ramped, but how could we possibly know if something was fuzzy from a slab of rock from 150 million years ago? Well, in exceptionally rare cases, soft tissues can be preserved. It's how we know T-Rex likely had lots of feathers covering them as juveniles and kind of grew out of that as they got older. At least that's the last time I researched that. As of 2021, that is constantly being researched, so that might have changed. So soft tissue can be preserved in a couple different ways, where essentially the shape of the soft tissues is preserved in the rock. And as far as I know, fossils of a Neuronathus specifically have not been found with that level of preservation, but some of their close relatives have, like Geolopterus, a slightly larger relative in the same family as a Neuronathus. Their family is called a Neuronathidae, since a Neuronathus was found first. Geolopterus has similar stuff going on and has an insanely well-preserved fossil. And in 2009, scientists released, really, it's not a fucking album published a paper breaking down all the kinds of stuff they had going on in their soft tissues, including structures called pycnofibers. Pycnofibers are pterosaur fluffs or fluff. Mammal fluff is hair, bird fluff is feathers, and pterosaur fluff is pycnofibers. Different structures, but fluff nonetheless. And pycnofibers actually seem to have been a universal pterosaur trait, meaning many, if not all of them had them. So they were likely present at the early stages of the pterosaur lineage. And there are multiple well-preserved pterosaur fossils that have them, like Sortes pelosis. And one published just last year, Tupandalactis. Unusual looking to say the least. Dude, some pterosaurs were just fucking flying Picasso paintings. Scientists have gone back and forth on whether or not pycnofibers were actually proto feathers, which were the early stages of feathers that dinosaurs had, and then eventually modern birds had regular feathers. It's a current debate. Scientists are in a tussle as we speak. So while a Neuronathus fossils haven't been well-preserved enough to see if they had pycnofibers, a smart assumption would be that they did have them since at least many pterosaurs and their close relatives had them. And the Neuronathus fossils do have these little bumps around the mouth, which were possibly some sort of bristles like whiskers, which is just the cherry on top for cuteness. And of course, each of these traits were actually adaptations that helped them survive, not just win the award for the most squishable little guy 150 million years ago. Well, actually, who's to say they weren't having squishable contests in the late Jurassic? We can't prove that they didn't. But all of these qualities made them perfectly adapted to hunting insects at night. Big eyes to see in low light conditions, pick no fibers, possibly for insulation, and muting the sounds of their wings while they're flapping to hide from their prey. Being small, I mean, endless answers, probably helps with maneuverability and taking off in small places and landing in small places compared to Quetzalcoatlus, which how the fuck, they probably needed a whole fucking landing strip. And so, a Neuronathus most likely lived a lifestyle similar to modern bats and owls. I was initially gonna end the video there, just one cute animal. But then I read through the comments on the community post about the survey and it became very clear to me that many of you are expecting me to talk about the dodo. We've got a lot of fans of the dodo, but here's the thing. I made an executive decision to not put the dodo in this video. So... <laughs> Yeah. Please let me explain before you do anything. I can already hear the keyboards clicking and clacking. Please, just one moment. I'm gonna show you a different extinct animal. The dodo is being talked about a lot right now because they were just put on the de-extinction list by Colossal, who is working on resurrecting the woolly mammoth, the Tasmanian tiger, and now the dodo. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. That's a topic I'm already planning on covering, so I wanna include them there. So let me show you the next one. As we know from our survey results, most people think of cute creatures as small. Wait the exception of elephants. Elephants are very large and people still think they are very cute. So I present to you the Sicilian pygmy elephant. Yes, a small elephant that lived in what is now Sicily. Fossil evidence suggests they had a stature like wiener dogs, long torso and short legs, and they had baby features throughout adulthood. But their cuteness is not the most interesting thing about them. It's actually how they became so small. It's because of 
Sicily. Let me explain why. This is what the Sicilian pygmy elephant evolved from. The straight tusk elephant. The largest elephant to ever exist that we know of. And the biggest mammal by mass to ever walk the planet that we know of. Of course, not including whales because they don't walk. These elephants were estimated to have gotten to 30,000 pounds. They were so big you could have walked right under one. And they were found all throughout Europe and Asia during the Pleistocene until about 20,000 years ago. If you're familiar with the Pleistocene or saw my Ice Age iceberg video, you might know that during this time, sea levels were changing due to drastic fluctuations in climate and the glaciers freezing and melting and freezing and melting and freezing and melting. So, Italy and Sicily were occasionally connected by a land bridge when sea levels were lower. It seems as though a population of straight tusked elephants migrated to Sicily over the land bridge and eventually became isolated when sea levels rose and the land bridge disappeared. And they shrunk over a long period of time, but it was relatively quick considering how drastic that change was from a 14 ton beast to a little guy the size of a Shetland pony. So, why? One explanation that you might be familiar with is called island rule. That essentially says on islands, big animals evolve smaller size and small animals evolve bigger size. Smaller creatures don't have their mainland predators and can control more resources so they get bigger and large animals have more limited food, more limited area, so they get smaller. It's a very loose general trend, meaning it doesn't always happen that way, but enough times for people to be like, coincidence? I think not! Take it however you want to. Some scientists don't really fuck with it, others kind of fuck with it at home. It is what it is. It is what it is! Regardless of how and why it happened, Sicilian pygmy elephants were just 15% of their ancestors' original body mass. And depending on when they migrated to Sicily, sometime between 175,000 to 50,000 years ago, this could have happened in as little as 40 generations, which is just insane. And so maybe Colossal will add them to the de-extinction list as well. Those are the cute little guys for today. And like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm gonna give you a little tour of my new apartment. So let's do that now. This is what the living room looks like on a daily basis when the couch isn't pulled out from the wall for me to film. As you can see, I do use the whiteboard for notes. And then on the other side is Tina, who is crawling around right now. There he is. Hi, buddy. And my Gibson guitar that I used to have on the floor in the last setup has now been replaced Actually, I switch off between these two. I sometimes put this one there because that's really close to the couch, as you can see, but it works for now. Then, the kitchen. I have some more plants over here. So, uh, what is that? Six plants. I also have these oryx horns. I've never shown these on camera because they don't work in the background, but these are actually real. I found them on the ground in Namibia and got them cleaned up by a taxidermist and got a permit to bring them back to the States. The only bag they fit in was a rifle bag though. So um, there were a lot of questions at the airport. All right, this is my bathroom. This is not done because I, I need to do something with those lights, but I don't know if I should put them in the shower. Here's a shower. You can kind of see the shower. And I have these really cool pictures up here that were done by an artist named Tankus on canvasfreaks.com. That one as well. Really sick. And finally, the bedroom. This room is not done at all. I'm having a hard time with it right now. I have a lot of stuff to put up still, but here's my YouTube award and this really cool picture that somebody drew of me with my stepladder in the background. I have a couple other framed pictures that I wanna put up, but I still haven't found a place for them. This is my Fender guitar. This is my baby. I still need to hang this one up. It's gonna go in the living room. And it turns out that the stepladder has been the best purchase I've ever made in terms of living in this apartment because I'm short and I, I can't reach that. So I use it on a daily basis. Shit, Tino came out. Tino's crawling around because Koya is sleeping. Also, I finally made a Patreon. It is now live. Obviously, I'm still just figuring out what's going on here, so for now, I just have two tiers. The first tier, Sakabam Baspis, will give you early access to my YouTube videos and live streams. I'm gonna be doing live streams there. I used to do it on TikTok, but I'm not really feeling that anymore. I would rather do it on Patreon, which will be fun because we can have a smaller group and have cool conversations and stuff. And the second tier, Telescope Fish, gives you everything in tier one, along with behind the scenes content, which for now is just little updates while I'm researching on my couch, but will eventually turn into really cool stuff later on in the year. And the ability to vote on upcoming long form topics. So. If you're interested, I would love for you to check it out and hopefully you'll join the community and pop in for some live streams. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next long form video coming out next week because now we're back on track and you can keep up with my daily short form content on TikTok and Instagram. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya!
wonder how this is looking. I have no idea what this what because I've never but uh, it's Saturday, so I got whiskey on the rocks. Don't put that in the video. Or maybe at the end. I don't 